And hey, everybody, I'm the Doc Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. Welcome to Open. Coming up on today's show, we'll sit down with an up-and-coming filmmaker discussing his latest short film and his accomplishments. Then we'll speak to a uh, business owner, author, and mental health professional about caregivers and ways to reclaim self-care. Plus, we'll sit down with an author who will speak about her passion for writing and highlight her book, How William Got His Wings. And finally, we'll sit down with the director of a, a local music group that will be ringing in the holiday. We'll let you know more about that and their upcoming concert. Don't want to miss it. You, It's all right here. You don't want to miss it. So sit back, kick off your shoes, and relax your feet. I've got it all going on for you right here on 107.5 WBLS and open. Bronx Nets open. Yeah, I'm your host, the Doc Bob Lee, and uh, you watch it open. It's that live interactive program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to your TV set. You can stay connected to us through social media at BronxNet TV. Now, leading things off, our first guest is a, an aspiring filmmaker whose passion for storytelling has recently been well recognized with the Best Upcoming Film Award at the International Film Festival, Manhattan. Today, he opens up about the creative journey behind his latest short film, Would You Still Love Me? If I Were a Worm, sharing his insights into his unique vision and the collaborative process that uh, brought this project to life. Please welcome to the show, Kyle. I'm going to say it right here. Look, Kyle DeMiao. Welcome, Kyle. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure being on the show. Um, I'm glad to be here. All right. So how did you get into this? Uh, you had to start from somewhere. Give us the beginnings. Uh, so originally, the concept of it came from this social media trend that was turning around fall of 2022. Uh -huh. It was uh, um, partners asking their, their significant others, would you still love me if I were a worm? And my partner happened to <laughs> just <laughs> ask me this question nonstop. And to, my, to her dismay, I answered no multiple times in a row. <laughs> I think it was like after maybe the eighth time at that point, I uh -huh. started to like think about it as a concept. Like, would I still be able to love my partner if you know, I couldn't love them in the same capacity I used to, right? There's, yeah. And then that's where the idea, idea, idea itself started evolving, right? Yeah. Like I eventually thought of it like more so as a unrequited thing or just being in, incapable of receiving the same love and such. Because like, you know, a worm, it, it's hard to really experience the same relationship with a worm versus a person, you know? <laughs> so I thought like, <laughs> hey, let's make it out. an idea, you know? And I, yeah. I wanted to make stuff with my friends and we did, you know? Uh -huh. That's so worm depicting what? I mean, being less than? Well, not per se less than. It's more like a feeling of just... If I were different? Helplessness, you Helplessness. Know? Like, when I think about a worm, like, specifically the string worm, I feel like, you know, a little, like, loose, I guess. Uh, sort of, like, led on a string, literally. Yeah. Like, by either destiny or circumstance. Uh, mm -hmm. To be, like, a little flimsy in the matter. To not feel in control of the situation itself. And, you know, in some instances, like when someone won't love you back, you feel the same way, you know? Yeah, yeah. Can you share a little bit about uh, your creative process behind your latest short film? Well, yeah, that was a ride, honestly. It was uh, <laughs> as a student filmmaker, you know, when I was starting, I was very much just trying to scramble things together. I would like think about uh, what I actually had and what I was capable of doing. You know, uh, I didn't really have a budget until later. So I, I thought about what I could do with what I had for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, um, that actually was like our reshoots when we actually had more of a budget for the most part. Uh -huh. I got very fortunate enough to like, you know, uh, start working right after college and I was able to like round up everyone in the crew to like actually do this later on. Yeah. But the process wise, um, it was a lot of communication with my co-writer and, co and producer, MK Johnson. Uh, yeah, they, we collabed a lot. We would write scripts together. Uh -huh. We'd talk up, I'd give out a beat for the whole plot, like beat by beat, and we would write everything in between together. 
and see whose thing worked a little more and whatever worked, we would add it together. Yeah. I yeah. remember in college I had to put together some things like that also. <laughs> How do you uh, approach your storytelling and uh, develop the development of your, your concepts? Uh, film con concepts. So I'm a, a big fan of Freytag's pyramid, like using yeah. that to like outline a lot of my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, recently I've been like looking into using the hero's journey more often or like act structure. Like yeah. um, a big thing that I've been like looking into lately is uh streamlining consciousness into my writing instead of like following a mold per se uh, and just like trying to break out of it because like I, I research a lot of things like something I'm a big fan of is like four point opposition utilizing one concept for multiple characters stuff like that but yeah that's how I've been approaching these things lately yeah uh, just trying to like structure it or like sort of get off the rails if that that's the word for it yeah and how does it feel to become uh awarded the best upcoming filmmaker oh wow that was a uh, honestly a big surprise did to you me jump up and down do jumping jacks i did the, the opposite crew, i together. freaked you out <laughs> <laughs> i was like because the the award announced a few um awards before me was the uh, best student film right and that's what i submitted for yeah so when they announced someone else i was just like that's crazy you know i'm just like damn i i didn't make it and i, I'm, I was happy to be there you know just like as a filmmaker but yeah. then two awards later they're like best upcoming filmmaker goes up to kyle demia and i'm like my crew and i just like we're wide-eyed we're like, yeah. that's kind of like uh, is that us that's, did, wait wait did we, yeah that's all they called us yeah. ah! and then I, I went up there look at this right here that's oh, you yeah that it's uh Lewis that's the Bergeron. crew yeah it's, actually it's crew my partner my my worm you know uh -huh. uh my actor eli my dp some of my pas my first ad it was great. I, you know, I was happy that they were able to pull through and be there for me in this moment. Yeah. Because it meant a lot, you know? Yeah. It feels like so much because it's like been a whirlwind since then. I graduated mm -hmm. high school, I mean, not high school, college. College, yeah. yeah. And uh, got a job right after it. And now I got this award, like within the span of like less than a year now. Yeah. So yeah. you're piling it on, huh? Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to go through it, you What's know? What's next? What do you feel next? Um, I'm actually working on a couple of scripts right now. I'm working on two uh -huh. particularly. Um, I'm working on on the script regarding my own generational trauma as like a Filipino American. Yeah. Cause I feel like, you know, with all the things that have come out lately, like, you know, films like everything everywhere all at once, uh, the farewell. And I think like past lives, I remember Minaru, Minari, the, the, the A24 film with Steven Young. But point being is that yeah. I feel like Southeast Asians aren't really represented within media as much. It's mostly favorable to East Asian people. Yeah. Like I've had people come up to me and ask me, Hey, are you like Korean or Chinese or are you, everything that isn't like filipino and i'm like yeah no <laughs> i mean I just, hey, you know what you know? <laughs> let me shake your hand yeah you're not alone yeah <laughs> Thank you. but you you mentioned you yeah. were traumatized mm -hmm. um explain that uh i mean you know growing up as you know a first uh generation you know like i was the the eldest son out of three you yeah. know three kids um to you know first generation immigrants and my dad and mom they had like a lot of dreams set out for me right right and obviously within the way you know wires like were crossed uh you know there are differences in perspective you know it's mm -hmm. it's intersectionality everyone's born and raised a different way yeah. and they tried to impose things that i didn't necessarily believe in or really lined up with how i thought my life should like you know yeah uh, is it still bothering you today? Oh, I mean, maybe sometimes, but so, like, actually, you know, I think it's pretty good. My dad gave me a ride here. Yeah. <laughs> he was really happy to like give me the ride. Yeah. He was proud of me for the award. My mom constantly supporting me, you know. Yeah. I mean, we do have like, you know, our scuffles once in a while. I'm not like of a course. lot anymore. It's a family. Yeah. yeah. yeah I mean, if you're not, that's I think the thing is like, you know, if you aren't really fighting once in a while, then I don't think, you know, that's really you communicating, you know. Yeah. I mean, obviously, I don't encourage like, you know, disputes, but I do encourage the communication. You yeah. Know? Yeah. So we're going to bring in a trailer right here. You want to bring it up? To, uh, let's talk about it. Bring yeah, it in. Yeah. Introduce it to uh, chorus. Yeah, yeah. The Would You Still Love Me If I Were a Worm trailer. Yeah. Um, that was uh, a fun one, you know, just like making that. Uh, actually, I made the first trailer was by the producer, uh -huh. uh, MK, and they edited the that because I was busy with work. And then when I got uh, invited to the International Film Festival in Manhattan, and like when I finally got in, they told me I needed to make a promo trailer, and I made my own. Yeah. And I made it on a trackpad with a laptop and it was oh, it was rough. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine editing everything yeah. on like a pad. <laughs> like I was just like, <laughs> what do you what do you do? You need a mouse to like, <laughs> like I'm just like I'm, I'll miss a frame. And I did miss a frame, actually. If you watch the trailers of a flash. Oh, we're gonna check it out oh, right yeah. now. Let's see if we can catch it right here. Let's check it out.
you think? I mean, it's something. It really is, but. <laughs> How do you. Hey! Do you have any idea how hard I've been working on these pieces? Insulting your work was never my intention, okay? I don't want to talk about this anymore. Emma, I love you, and the fact that you But I don't love you anymore, Alice. What? I know you're hurting, but you gotta stop this. I care about you, but I can't right now. I still love her, man. Yeah, I know, buddy. Things are gonna be okay. All right? Would you still love me if I were a worm? Now you're going to come up with a song. That I, goes with it. <laughs> you know, actually, the composer, you know, asked if we wanted to put lyrics in some of the things. I'm just like, you know, maybe. I'm thinking about it. Maybe if you could sing it for us, you know. So I'll think about it. <laughs> I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll practice a little bit, maybe. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what's next for you? Um, well, yeah, I'm working on my two scripts at the moment. I'm currently mm -hmm. helping... My other friends with their productions. I don't want to be just the only person who's making stuff. Yeah. Like I'm helping them just like you know produce their own films, uh, you know uh, casting calls. I was actually on a casting call before. Oh, like yeah? James actually like hit me up about stuff. I was like going from gig to gig, you know. Um, but for me, I think mostly personally, I'm working on two scripts at the moment. Uh, one about you know my own trauma as like a Filipino American and right. like dealing with like my own parents and like them seeing me as a creative and uh another one about my caffeine addiction <laughs> oh okay. yeah i got a really bad caffeine really kick. yeah yeah hey bring in some coffee yeah hey, honestly that would be great we're strong yeah. bustello oh yeah let them try some bustello oh yeah <laughs> I, I i need that <laughs> some cafe con leche yeah yeah con leche, yeah <laughs> coffee with milk yeah so um those are some of the things that you're going to put together mm -hmm. so as a filmmaker Hmm. Where do you want to go? You want to do be like a Spike Lee? Who are some of your favorite uh, producers? Well, Spike Lee's great. You know, mm. I actually I remember when I tried to apply to NYU, I was like, I really want to take Professor Lee's class. You know, but um, definitely Christopher Nolan, just because you know, big fan of uh, Batman, like just in general, and in, I love his films. You know, Batman Begins is one of my favorite movies. Uh, Spike Lee, definitely his use of color and like just generally him. And actually, I, I was watching a lot of like films by him recently, which is fun because mm -hmm. you mentioned mentioning that. Um, who else has a director? But I mean, I don't really like. I guess for me, right personally, I've been like looking at myself. Like, do I want to be like Nolan? Like, mm -hmm. do I want to like follow that path? Right. Yeah, yeah. But I've sort of been getting off that track. I've been trying to find out which me I want to be, you know? Yeah. Like, I do want to be like them to some facet, but I want to discover myself the more. The me <laughs> It's finding out which me you want to me? be? Me, yeah. Oh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Listen, give me a social media and everything. Where can we follow you? Uh, you can follow me on Instagram at KyleDM underscore, or you can find me on LinkedIn, IMDB, stuff like that. Uh, my YouTube channel which mm -hmm. is Kyle DM, I believe, off the top of my head. Yeah. 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 Kyle DeMeow, mm -hmm. thank you so much. Thank you. Would you still love me if I were a worm? Of course, Bob. That's it. I would. <laughs> All right. Thank you, man. Good luck with everything. Okay? Thank you. I appreciate right. it. See you soon. All right. Soon. All right. We'll take a quick break right here. We've got more open coming your way next. <laughs>
And welcome back. I'm the Dr. Bob Lee from 107.5 WBLS. You are watching Open. Thank you so much. Thank you for letting us share in the space and time with you. Our next guest is a mother, an author, and the founder of Latinx and Social Work. So check this out. She joins us today. She's no stranger to the show. She joins us today to speak about caregivers and the importance of self-care and self-love. Mm. So please welcome to the show, Erica Sandoval. Welcome, Erica. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me here today. What is all the self-love about? You know, we need more love in the world. And this is an excellent time to talk about self-love, especially for caregivers who are doing such great work and taking care of others. Exactly. I think that a lot of times we often just care for our our community, our families, yeah. and sometimes we just forget to give ourselves that TLC. And we need that tender need loving that care. TLC. In order, you know, just as uh, we're told, um, put the oxygen mask on you first yeah. before you help everyone else. We don't do that often. If you don't give the TLC, you'll become a scrub. Well, you could become a lot of things. <laughs> you could become a lot of things, right, TLC? You're funny. <laughs> <laughs> but wait a minute. Give us a little background on you. Well, I'm a mom first. Uh, uh -huh. Mom, I raised my daughter as a single mom. Uh -huh. I was born in Ecuador and uh, raised in Astoria, Queens. And I put myself through college um, while mm -hmm. taking care of Isabella. And I realized that I needed a lot of uh, TLC for myself in order to just raise her with so much compassion and love yeah, yeah. and not have all the anxiety that I felt while going to school um, trigger into her life. And so that is the reason why I became a social worker yeah. and I support parents and students and young adults. Um, and we have a small group practice now that mm -hmm. we have bilingual, bicultural social workers that supports um, teenagers because I just realize that mental health is often ignored um, and physical health is really what people focus on. But yeah. without our mental health, we can't we can't heal our, our mm. bodies and we get sick and then our physical manifestations happen. So, yeah. so well, be, mental health is tough to get the physical health in line. Exactly. You know, I guess it starts from here and from there. How impactful can managing stress for caregivers be and how important is it for them to uh, practice self-care? Well, managing stress, if you just think of your life and how stressful things can be and how things add up and what happens to your body when you have toxic stress, you tend to lose sleep, yeah. you tend to get sick, you might have headaches, body aches. How are you going to be the best version of yourself for your kids? How are you going to mm -hmm. be the That's best true. version of yourself for your partner, for the community that you serve? So managing that toxic stress and that stress to just bring yourself to a place of peace and stillness yeah. is going to make the world a better place because you're going to show up better. That's right. That's when it. You step into the room, they're going to know. They're going to know. You're going to light like, up the room with your love and, you know, and that self-care look. That <laughs> <laughs> How important is it for others to practice self-care? and self-love. You got to love yourself first before you can do anything else. And it's hard for people to love themselves. Let's just yeah. normalize that too. It's easier said than done. You know, love yourself, love yourself. Yeah. You often hear that. And sometimes it's really Why difficult. Why is she telling me that? I right? hate myself. Right. Like ah. sometimes you were just raised in a way that yeah. you're just so critical to yourself that there's, it's difficult mm -hmm. for you to care about yourself. So let's normalize the fact that maybe it's been hard. But one step at a time is just giving yourself that 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 time to just see yourself with all your yeah. incredible parts and all that beauty that you show up with. And then just like think of your mind like a plant and you're watering that plant and you're giving it water, you're giving it sunlight and you're becoming amazing and you're growing because you're yeah. giving it the TLC it needs, you're, that's, the, caregiver. you're the caregiver to yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you're a caregiver to others, you have to care for yourself first. Excellent. I like that analogy right there. And while you were saying that, I do have a plant that I take care of you and do. they depend on you. They do. And how's it going? How's that plant going? Yeah, it's been there for a few years so oh, far. Oh, I love that. <laughs> do you name your plants? Uh, no, I just... 
pet it and everything. I pet it like a pet. That's beautiful. You know, put my hands in the leaves. And you then, talk and to it. it. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And so, see, imagine, you know, just caring for yourself that way. Yeah. The yeah. way we care for others. But some people, they make that mistake. They don't take care of themselves first. You know, there's a company called Health First. Right. And, you know, right. when I speak uh, on, on stage and out in the community, we talk about how to take care of yourself first before you can begin to take care of others. Exactly. So you're, you're right on, right on target with that, with, you know, what you're doing and what you're talking about. How many years have you been in business? Well, I've been in practice over 10 years. We as call a it practice, not business. Clinical social work. I've been a social work for over a decade, and this is my second year in business. Yeah. And I realize how incredible it is to serve the community it doesn't feel mm. like work it feels like my life purpose to just be here and center and connect and collaborate because sandoval collab is about collaborating with yeah. incredible people to bring services and community healing to our community that's yeah. what we do i love what you do thank you and then you have uh, the book uh, latinx and social work Yes, Latinx and Social Work. We uh, published two books in English and in Spanish, Latinx and Social Work and Latinx, Latina and Social Work. And it's a collection of personal narratives. There it is right there. Yes, and it's a collection of personal narratives for um, social workers or mm. people that are thinking of becoming a social worker to really read about the trauma, but focus on the resilience while navigating your life. Because a lot of times we tend to think we cannot accomplish something, especially mm -hmm. if we're a person of color who has come from uh, communities that often have been marginalized. Yeah. We really want to support our future leaders in knowing that they can. And you know that the second book, Latinx and Social Work, Latin A and Social Work, mm -hmm. we just Oops. won Best Self Transformation <gasps> All right. Book. Congratulations. Yes, thank you. Congratulations. Yeah. If it, Yes, if it wasn't for all the authors and yeah. their brave voices and sharing their personal narratives, this would have not happened. Yeah, and yeah. we won silver and then we are now best self transformation book yeah. and, and we have a journal. The journals, talk about that. It I'll accompanies the book. Yes, thank you. See, you know our I love that you know our <laughs> stuff. The journal is uh well, I hear things in my head. You do? And it tells me all about your stuff <laughs> while we're going along. I love it. <laughs> They're doing a great right job. There. It looks good. Look at that. Yes. And it's published with three other incredible authors. Uh -huh. uh, and we have prompts. We have about over 170 prompts mm -hmm. that after you read one of the personal narratives from one of the authors, it helps you prompt in exploring and processing your thoughts. We call it narrative medicine. I like that. Everything is about growing and and healing and and moving forward, but in a in a good way. Yeah. It doesn't always have to be about talk therapy. Yeah. It could be about processing your feelings through journal entry and writing or connecting in community. There's so many different ways to connect. Did and you did you name it narrative medicine? Actually, that's a term that we use in social in work social and work, in healthcare yeah. that we really can focus on journal writing as part of the medicine, part of yeah. your own healing journey. And yeah, get it out of the head. Put yeah, the pen to put the it, paper. Put it on yes. Paper. And a lot of the times we often don't see the person right. um, as as a whole person. We often just see the person with like a name and and, and, and a number. Yeah. But when you're thinking about the narrative, like the person in general, you're getting their whole story. Yeah. And our, we're made of so many different elements. So and that helps the person. That helps the person. Yeah. So this is getting your whole self out onto paper and, and healing yourself is a beautiful way. Yeah, there was a person here uh, a few years back. They came and they, they, they wrote a book and they grew up with this situation in their home mm -hmm. where a, a son passed away. I think from the father. I think the father beat him and oh. passed away. Oh no! I said, That's "How did horrible. that feel going back and forth, knowing that your brother was?" I thought it was normal, but she kind of woke up when she was eighteen, nineteen years old, and called the authorities. And 
tried to help her out and you know mentally they took the father to jail and everybody uh but she wrote a book she had to get it out of her head because she was very traumatized because she yes. grew up thinking that that was normal and i know you could have if you've got you've gotten a hold of the, that person you could have probably really mm. helped her out because she came here with a deeply rooted problem yes right? yes it's ptsd is yeah. very real it doesn't discriminate yeah post-traumatic stress disorder trauma we all have community trauma, um, individual trauma, collective yeah. trauma, and that trauma just is very intense. Yeah. And you know, just what you were sharing is that a lot of the authors shared that once they wrote their personal narratives and they put it on paper, there was this amazing sense of release yeah. and relief. And we've become such a incredible collective and just really close and mm. supporting each other because now we are building community. Yeah, yeah. So, so anything new coming up that uh, all of the stuff is new that you're talking about because you, every time you come, you share something new with us. But uh, what's on the horizon? We have soul immersion healing circles that I invite everyone to join. Anyone that is uh, wants to sit in community mm -hmm. and it's on Monday, December 4th. Uh, and you can use a code uh, to get a $40 off. Um, and it's Black Friday, and it is a collaboration between three incredible holistic healers, Carolina Boulevard, who is a holistic healer. She sits with mm -hmm. cacao medicine and Ana Anapurna and Gabriel Jimenez. So Gabriel is a music therapist. Uh, um, Andrea, yes, Andrea is a yogi. And Carolina sits with cacao medicine. So we created, That's deep. yeah, we yeah. created this incredible healing circle where we're going to be serving cacao and sitting together as a community with amazing sound. I'm loving it. Is it on your website? It is. It's on the website, sandovalcollab.com. Uh -huh. And it's at Love Drum in Astoria, Queens. And it really, That's where all the good food is, ladies and gentlemen. It is. It is. You know a story well. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really beautiful time to just give yourself some peace. And if you're it. a caretaker and you're caring, because we all are caretakers, we're caring for our children, our community, ourselves. Come and take care of yourself. Just there give you yourself go. those three hours. Thank you so much. Erica Sandoval, LCSW, founder of Latinx and Social Work and Sandoval Collab. Yes, thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for coming. Thank Have you. a good holiday. You too. too. Have a beautiful holiday. We'll take a quick break right here. But, 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 but wait, we've got more coming up next on Open. Welcome back. Our next guest is an author with over 23 years of experience as a teacher of elementary school and special needs students. So she joins us today to speak about her passion for writing and so much more. So please welcome to the show, Tracy Adams. Tracy, welcome. Hello. Tracy, now you you are you in the Midwest right now? No, I'm in Alabama right now. Alabama. All right. Yeah. But you're from the Midwest, right? I'm born and raised in Kansas City, Missouri. All right. Kansas City. Kansas yes. City, here I come. Go Chiefs. Yeah. <laughs> so you made your way down into the south by way of uh, Kansas City oh, into Atlanta, down into Alabama. You went a little deeper. Yes. yes. Well, I've kind of lived here and there. I lived in Denver for four years before coming uh -huh. to the south. Um, and I stayed here for about uh, 20 
26 years and then got divorced and then I moved to the West Coast for a year and then made my way back. So I've, I've kind of moved around these last few years. And Tracy, when did you get into writing? Before your divorce oh, or after? Oh, long before. I started writing when I was a kid, um, just keeping journals. And I heard your last uh, interviewer talk about journaling, and I've been doing that since I was a kid. You know, I was telling um, her about you. I said, you know what? Tracy does journaling. I think we're going to try to hook you guys up. Yes, that would be absolutely, because she's a social worker, and being a teacher of special needs, I work with social workers. I collaborate them, with them all the time, so that would be perfect. That would be 100% perfect. But um, she mentioned about journaling, and I mean, I've been journaling. I have journals dated back to 1997. And how ha have these uh, journals or journaling helped you in your career or in writing? In life, you in know, life. life, yeah, life happens. And, um, you know, mm. through my marriage and the dissolvement of my marriage, journaling has helped me. Um, you know, I lost uh, three babies uh, through miscarriage and just journaling my way through that. It, it, it really is an outlet. It really is a uh, therapy, mental therapy. I think it's a form of mental therapy and this, um, I just decided in these last uh, almost eight years to, to um, bring my journaling into, into book writing. Um, yeah. I, I have, I have um, three realistic fiction books um, that I'm working on and that they basically have written themselves through my journals. Ah, excellent. You, you just had like a head start. You had everything yes. all written out. All you have to do is place them in the outlines in place of, of everything. Strategically yeah. and editing and, you know, and making sure that it's worded right, that yeah. the voice that I'm speaking in, um, that it sounds right. You know, I just want the, the readers to be able to hear my voice um, when, when I'm writing it so they'll know exactly uh, where I'm coming from. And uh, like I said, I, I write according to what's going on in my life. Um, yeah. How Wilson got, got His Wings is not my first written book. Uh, my first actually written book is entitled Maya and the Ants. And it's uh, I wrote that about my two daughters back in 2016. Uh -huh. But I just, it's on the shelf. It's written. It's ready to go for illustrating and publishing. Yeah. But like I said, life, life happened. And um, so here we have how William got his wings and his very passionate um, story for me because it's about one of my students that I had um, two years ago. He was in second grade, a precious little boy, and um, he started getting sick. I don't want to tell the whole story, but um, he had a brain tumor that developed into uh, brain cancer. And um, I was planning on writing a book with him. He was going to illustrate and I was going to write it. And it was going to be called William's Journey. But uh, he and God had other plans. And so it became how William got his wings. Excellent. Excellent. Yes. Excellent. Wow. And it's, uh, I wrote it um, initially as a children's book, but so many adults um, that have purchased this book have been so moved by it, you know, and it helps them deal with grief um, in a better way. You know, grief, I mean, death happens to all of us, you yeah, know, yeah. whether we lose a parent or a spouse or a child, um, it, it happens. And, you know, you just need that comfort because it, it is so hurtful when you lose some, somebody that's that dear to you and um this little boy william he was dear to all of us you know yeah. his parents his grandparents um some of his classmates came to his service and you know just trying yeah. to explain to these eight-year-olds what what is happening what happened to our friend um and so that's what uh motivate motivated me to um to write this book and i wrote it in tears and it was a lot of tears and wow uh, emotions and compassion in writing this book. And I got permission from William William's dad to write it. He said, absolutely, 100%. And um, a portion of the proceeds goes to William's family. Oh, great, great. I just, I wanted it to be a blessing to, the, to them, something that 
they, they can have tangible that will carry on his memory. Yeah, and you have a, a, a that's that's perfect. That's wonderful. Yes. But you also have a um, a book distribution platform, um, TNA Literary Works. Yes, tell us, it's where tell I us a little bit more about that. Yes, um, that uh, TNA Literary Works was uh, birthed uh, last year after um, how William got his wings uh, was published, and it's just a pl platform where I want to distribute. Um, all of my books and my works um, that I'm working on um, right now. And in fact, I'm work, um, in publishing now for How William Met Mommy. And um, I got the sketches back from the illustrator and everything. And um, the, the tentative date yeah. for that book to go live is February 1st. Ah, all right. 2024. <laughs> 2024. Yeah. And um, I wrote that one. Like I said, I wrote that one last year after I buried my mom. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah. sorry. Yeah. She passed away actually two weeks after William. And it was, you know, I write according to what's going on in my life at that time. And, and that book, uh, again, a lot of passion and emotion that went into writing it. Um, William died on July the 7th. My mother died July 23rd. And do and you think they, they were both a part of helping you to write this book? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, 100%. Um, you know, I mean, if you haven't experienced it, you know, losing a parent is just, there's no words. There's yeah. no words. Um, and I just, that, that was an outlet for me. And I just, it was a story that I wanted to share. Um, so many of my friends, mm -hmm. teacher friends, you know, college friends have lost their parents, you know, within these last few years, you know, and I just wanted to have something that they could, um, that they can have that would bring them comfort. Well, you know, William and your mom will be with you every step of the way. You know, you've got yes. these things that will never never go away you have yeah. these books uh, out there that even after we're gone these books are going to stay here and exactly. people will be able to pick them up and read them so and you can leave them. a legacy and they're going to be of course a part of that you know a part of that yes yeah. beautiful beautiful so yeah. what's next for you do you have any additional plans behind these current book projects Yes, um, I have another book that I um, that I have written, and it's in publishing as well. Um, it's called Too Much of a Good Thing, A Runner's Journey. And uh, as I stated before, um, I write according to what's happening with me at that time. And during summer school, I was teaching fifth grade, and one of their writing topics was, you know, write about um, something that you really, really love that could be too much of a good thing. And, you know, they were sitting there and, you know, uh -huh. fifth graders, they don't like to write. So I said, well, you know, I modeled for them. You know, I said, I love to run. And they looked like, Miss Adams, you like to run? I said, yeah. I said, I can't run now because I got these bum hips. But, <laughs> and I, so I just started, you know, that, that day after school, I just started writing. I uh -huh. said, you know what, this, this, this is a book. So I wrote about uh, my passion for running. Uh, I started running when I was 18 years old, and yeah. I ran all the way up until 2016, where, where my body just gave out. I couldn't run anymore. Yeah. Um, me and my girls were in a head-on collision in 15, then, you know. Yeah. So here I stand, ended up having to have hip surgery, you know, planning to have Oh, that's what you said. One. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I see the doctor, the ortho tomorrow, actually, um, to uh, plan for the for the left hip. But you know, you, you just never never know how your story will impact other people. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I ran track at Morris Brown College, and just seeing some of my college um, running mates, they're like, "Oh my God, my back!" And they've had knee surgery and hip surgery and all these things going on. So um, you know, that it's just another story that I wanted to share. Um, to bring light to that. You, you just never know until you go through it. It's all a part of life, right? That you mentioned before. It's, it's helping you to do yes. life, putting the pen to the paper. Pen to the paper. Um, I have several works. One is called, uh, it's a realistic fiction book, um, and it's titled While I Run This Race. 
And it's about, you know, a young woman who leaves her home to come to an HBCU. And uh, she meets her track coach who instills running, um, you know, in her spirit and everything. And she goes on to do big things, you know, becoming a coach herself. And uh, I, I started writing that book um, after we lost our track coach in 2016. Woo. Well, wait a minute. You got something going on there. After somebody cuts out, you write a book. I write a book. And yeah. Then, yeah. It, just, it helps you to cope with all the things that are happening in life. I get it. I get it. Yes. 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 But, I mean, I have some fun things. I wrote a yeah. book about my, my oldest daughter. Well, these things um, are helping people in their lives, you know. Yeah. And, because so, I mean, it happens. It's life. Yeah, you know, yeah. you can't ignore that. Um, but you wrote just, a. You said you wrote a book about your your daughter. My oldest daughter yeah. uh, is called I Am Leo, and she is a Leo child, yeah. true and true. And I just looked at you know how Leos and the the animal, the lion, how they operate in the wild. Yeah. And when I tell you the correlation is uncanny. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and that one is called I Am Leo, and it's about my oldest my oldest daughter. Yeah. How does she feel yeah. about that? Uh, she's like, no, <laughs> Mama, why are you writing about me? She's a teenager, so uh -huh. she's like, well, why are you writing about me? Mm -hmm. You know, I say, get over it. You, you know, that, that's what Mama does. You know? Yeah, but that will be uh, bragging rights for her. She can share with a friend, look what my mama wrote about me. Exactly. Exactly right. It's nothing bad, you know. Is I mean, she's. Mm -hmm. I mean, she's that. That's my daughter, and you know, and I just like to write on, you know, things about my family and everything like that. Um, uh, the another book that I'm going to be writing is called "There's Nothing Dreadful About My Hair." Woo! And You're putting it out there, huh? Yeah, and that's about my oldest daughter because she has oh. long, you know, dreads. Yeah. And uh, you know how kids can be mean. And so they're asking, is that your real hair? Yeah, and, yeah. Oh, your hair looks this way and that way. And oh, you got dreadlocks. And I told her, there's nothing dreadful about your hair. Yeah. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So this is all coming out in 2024? Well, 2024 is how William met mommy. And, uh, um, Runner's Journey, and um, I'm also working on um, uh, publishing a third book. It's called Missing Mommy Moments, uh -huh. and I journaled from, you know, last July all the way up until I felt like I'm not healed. You'll never be healed from losing your parent, but to where I felt, you know, at peace yeah. about it. So uh, that one is called mm -hmm. Missing Mommy Mo Moments, and it's just journaling. There you go. You know, my Journal, experience journaling superstar and author and publisher publisher Tracy Nicole Adams. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us. Good luck with Appreciate everything. Okay? You Thank you, it. sir. All right. Talk to you soon. All Thank right. We'll you. take a quick break. I've got another one coming up next right after this. Welcome back. Our last guest is a multifaceted musician and a leading professional career uh, as a pianist. She does her thing. She's a conductor also, mezzo-soprano, vocalist, and an instrumental coach, teaching artists uh, some of the best stuff that they want to know when they come to a person like her. She joins us to speak about her, her next role as the music director for Riverdale Choral Society and to promote their upcoming winter concert. So please put your hands together and welcome, give her a warm welcome, uh, Monsong Wong. Welcome to the show. Hello. All right. Mong Chong. Nice to meet you. Yeah, Mong Chong, right? 
Did I say that right? Yes. Okay. So give us a little background of uh, how you got it all together, how you got started, and all your teachings and all of the wonderful things that you do within your craft. Oh, wow. Um, I started when I was four years old um, as a pianist. I, 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 um, I saw somebody playing the piano in a shopping mall, and I fell in love with it. And mm. I asked my friends, can I, can I try this? So that's how I got, got started on the piano. And um, later on, I worked with uh, singers. So I, and I, I got in touch with, wow, this is fun singing. Mm -hmm. So And then I, I started, you know, uh, finding teachers and learn, learning the craft. And then, uh, well, sometimes the teachers at, at, at my high school, um, they, are too, they were too busy. So they yeah. asked me, oh, can you, can you help leading rehearsals um, uh, during this uh, lunch break or, uh, you know, uh, arranging scores. So I just took, took the uh, requests and then, oh, sure, no problem. And I think that's how it got me started uh, as a uh, conduct yeah. fellow, um, just, just, you know, leading a group. And I, I, I find a lot of fun things <clears throat> in it. Mong Chong, who, who inspired you? Who's your biggest uh, role model or the biggest person that you looked up to in your journey? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I... Well, there, uh, it's hard to just name one. I would say Mozart, Beethoven, Brahms, and Bach. Yeah. Ah, that's big. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Some interesting stuff that they wrote. <laughs> yeah. And what made you want to gravitate uh, to these uh, gentlemen? Um, the, 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 the musical ideas, or maybe it's, not just musical ideas, it's the ideas that that I hear from their music that I, I when I was younger, I felt bombarded uh, by these uh, just very bold ideas, uh, may I say, even mm -hmm. in their times, uh, I, I would say, uh, comparing the composition in their own time, and I find them, they were the innovators at the time. So um, I like to be um, learning how to be ahead of the time a little more, yeah. I guess, um, uh, being inventive. Yeah. And you wanted to learn from the best, right? Yes, they, they were yeah. the masters of the masters, yes. So how did Absolutely. you make your way over to the Riverdale Choral Society? Well, I was a accompanist. I was an accompanist in there, uh, uh, I would say maybe 10 years ago, we started 10 years ago, and we have this really, really great relationship since then. And um, I was there playing at the piano, and sometimes I was at the organ, and I, I was involved every season um, in the concert. And that's how got me started with uh, Riverdale Choral Society. Yeah. So if I wanted to come and play maybe the tambourine or something like that, or the cowbell, how, you know, how, how can I join? Yes. Oh, um, very, very easy. Um, you, you just, um, we always have open rehearsals in uh -huh. the beginning of the season. The first three weeks, you can just come over. Uh, it's usually on Wednesdays, 7 to eight, uh, seven to 9.15 mm -hmm. p.m. Uh, at uh, Christ Riverdale Church. There you go. And you just come over, bring your tambourine, bring your tam-tam, and, and see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> See, see what happens. Will I get kicked out, or will you you let me join? <laughs> we will find a piece that will that will fit you in. There you go. <laughs> or I can just clap my hands to the beat. <laughs> yes, we actually we we actually had a very versatile programming. Uh -huh. Sometimes it, it involves um you know body body percussions, and we 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 make different sounds. That's yeah. not just words. It's special effects. Excellent. Where will the be? Uh, where will the upcoming holiday concert be hosted? Uh, it will be at the Christ Church Riverdale. Um, that will be on the second Sunday of December, December tenth, mm -hmm. at three p.m. Yeah. And um, the program is um, is a really with the most most classical choral timeless pieces that everyone loves and I will, I'm sure if you come you will recognize some tunes as well and um, I, I and the program is it's not geared toward this Christmas or 
or Hanukkah or, or anything yet, but yeah. that's actually more to do with, um, I would say, offering healing energy and peace to the world um, in this time of, you know, one could say, well, there are a lot of, go- of things going on in There's the world, right? There's a lot right? going um, on, yes. Yes, safe to say. Um, I, I, yeah, and I think we can find solace mm-hmm. in music. And this is a great place to be. If you can come to our concert, I think you'll find some good feeling yeah. in you. And and what I know, I know I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Um, what piece will the chorus be presenting? Any special piece that we should uh, recognize or look for? Oh, yes. Um, so we will be presenting the Foray Requiem. Um, that's one of the uh, most popularly performed pieces um, mm-hmm. over the, I would say, last century perhaps and um and we have mozart laudate dominum from the vespers the solemn uh-huh. vespers and we have Brahms, guys licious lead um this is very soulful music that he wrote for the choir and um and two other pieces uh, we have foray cantique mm-hmm. the genre scene and painting this is the timeless piece called and i saw a new heaven that is a, a scripture from the Revelations from the Bible. All right. And Mon Chong, what's your favorite? Oh, that's a true question. <laughs> oh, my favorite. <laughs> um, <laughs> you were surprised. I, I'm surprised. <laughs> you love them um, all. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Requiem is uh, our choir's favorite, I would say, um, because they have performed that particular piece for a few times in the past two decades. Uh, yeah. And, and, and I'm sure when you're here, you also would recognize this. I think some of the music have been in the movies. Yeah. yeah. Who is some of the people who are performing with you? You want to give them a shout out, say hello, wave. Oh hand. yeah. Yes. Yes, absolutely. So we have, um, we have guest artists coming, um, Corinne Byrne, soprano, Trevor Hubschild, Barry Chung, and we have harpist and organist as well at our our concert as the uh, orchestra. Beautiful. All right. You ready? Everybody's ready? Yes, I am. You're ready Everybody to go? Everybody's ready. All right. Are you bringing your tambourine? I'm bringing my tambourine. <laughs> what else should I bring? Triangles. <laughs> <laughs> bring some cowbells, perhaps. <laughs> yeah. Is this All your right. first? Is this your first concert with the Riverdale uh, Chorus? Yes, yes, it's my first concert as a music director uh, with the Riverdale Choral Society, and I'm very, very, very excited. Yeah, but you've done this yeah. many times before, so you're not nervous or anything, right? No, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. It's just a new dynamic, you know, uh, uh-huh. sitting at a piano and standing on a podium. Uh, two entirely different. Things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one would imagine. So, <laughs> yeah, but you do this really all fun. the time. But you, yes, you still, absolutely. You still feel some jitters. I know I do when I come on on a set. Still feel some, you know, until you you iron it all out the first uh, maybe thirty seconds or whatever. Yes, absolutely. So, so in our rehearsals, we we always have these warm ups in the beginning. What are some of the things you, you do? Know, do you make noises? Yeah, we make noises. Um, sometimes we make noises. I would say, like, well, uh, let's say we're in a zoo and we're going to do. Just to get the air going, just yeah. to find the freedom in our yeah. articulators uh, and get that good feeling connecting with our breathing. And, somebody and then we're walking, ready to go. Yeah, and somebody walking backstage will think there's a bunch of crazy people backstage making noises, right? <laughs> Exactly. But these are some exactly. of the things that you do to prepare. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. Every every rehearsal, yeah. That's good. And we'll yeah. walk around singing and say, how are you on pitches? So So when you hit the stage, you, you're all warmed up and ready to go. Yes. More than ready, yes. Yeah. We get it cooking, yes. And so what happens after um, the big concert? Anything happening throughout the year? Yes, yes. So after the big concert, the upcoming, um, well, the, the upcoming event after the concert will be the um, the Saturday, the, the Saturday after the concert. Yeah. That uh, that is at three p.m. That we have a Messiah sing. That is welcome 
uh, to all anyone anyone who would like to come join us singing Messiah by yeah. Handel, and um, and we usually it is a community event in the in the um, in the mm -hmm. Bronx Beautiful. neighborhood. Yes. So you are, you are, again you you can bring your scores I'm, and uh, bring your instruments. I'm I'm coming. I'm gonna bring everything down that everything that I need to uh, to fit. The sound that you're gonna you're gonna make, so that everybody yes. coming can uh, feel nice and relaxed and listen to some beautiful music. Wonderful. Website, where can we go? It's riverdalechoral.org. Um, that is the website for the Riverdale Choral Society. Yeah. And <clears throat> and that you you have the information for the tickets for the upcoming concert. On December 10th, and also the Messiah Sing on the December 17th. There you go. Music director, Riverdale Choral Society, Meng Chung, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank good, you for having me. Good luck. I'm coming out there to dance and uh, be a part of everything that you're doing. <laughs> yes, can't wait. All right. Lovely meeting you. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today's show. We want to thank our guests for joining us, you, our viewers, for tuning in and checking it all out. Keep following BronxNet TV for continued coverage. Thank you for sharing. Let me share in this space and time with you. And you can join our hosts, Kip and Arleen, Darren Jaime, and Rena Valentin for the all-new episodes of Open, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday. For all of us here at BronxNet, have a great and enjoyable day. And always remember, what you are is God's gift to you. What you make of yourself is your gift to God. So choose your choice. Let your choice control the chooser of the Dr. Bob Lee. And I'll see you over 107.5 WBLS. I love you all.